Well, this morning we got a special treat here at the bridge. Uh, some of you remember Brother Steve McEwen. He's my friend from Arkansas. Uh, we do not have an interpreter interpreter available today. You should be able to understand him if you can understand me. But uh, seriously, he's been one of my close friends since I was probably 14 years old, 13. I don't even remember the first time I met Steve. His uncle uh, ran a grocery store in Hector, and when he passed, we have no longer have a grocery store. That's how vital his family is, and his aunt runs the hardware. Kind of crazy, isn't it? So it should be McEwenville instead of Hector, I guess. But nonetheless, Steve is here, and he's going to share the word today. So I hope you'll welcome him as he comes to minister today. Brother Steve, thanks. Well, good morning. No, we are not brothers. We are not related. And you're a tough crowd. Good morning. And you're like, who is this hairy man from Arkansas? That's what the babies all say when I pick at them. My name is Steve McEwen. I'm the bishop of several bridge churches around the nation, and we are excited to be here with you today and share some things in our heart and what God is doing. And uh, my Lord, smile. Smile better. Amen. So are they always as tough? First service. First service. Everybody's awake yet. I'm not either. I'm not a morning. How many morning people do we have in here? Go home. She was telling the story about looking for volunteers, reminded me of my friend Elmer Towns, who's told the story years ago. There was a biker who got saved and he wanted to serve the Lord. And so he said the best way to serve the Lord is to go to church. So he got there two hours early, thought it was like a rock concert because you're going to have to get there two hours early to get a good seat. He said at a rock concert, the best seats were down front, so when the doors opened, he got there at 8 o'clock, the doors opened at 10 to 10, the service started at 10. He went down front, sat on front. He, he was saved, okay, but he still looked like a biker, and there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong at all. And so, but in a Baptist church, a formal Baptist church, when a biker walks in, it's a little awkward. And so they weren't used to that, weren't accustomed to that. And so he's sitting on the front road. He's got, he's got sleeveless leather on, and, and he's got braids in his hair, and he's got tattoos, and he's, he looks the biker part. And he's sitting there, and he's sitting there, and he said, the Holy Spirit says to him uh, that you're going to volunteer for something today. He said, I'm new. I don't know anybody here. And so the lady gets up to make an announcement, and uh, so she's leading the singing and she tells the congregation, we need help today with the nursery. Nobody does anything. Keeps on singing. Keeps on singing. Two stanzas. She gets up, stops in the middle and says again, I said we need some help in the nursery. Nobody. Nobody volunteers. And so this man is, says, I feel an unction from the Holy Spirit that I should volunteer. But look at me. That, I can't volunteer. I look, look at me. There's no way I could volunteer to work in the nursery. And so the, the singing keeps on going, and she's really getting frustrated. I said we need a volunteer for the nursery. He said, it's all I could do. I stood up and said, I'll go. Immediately, 40 women jumped up and ran to the nursery. Sometimes all you have to do is be willing. Sometimes all you have to do is make the first step. This world that we live in right now, circumstances are difficult. Things are hard. Sometimes things are, uh, drive us to the place where we want to quit. Has anybody ever wanted to quit? Has anybody ever quit and wish you hadn't? My motto is it's always too soon to quit. You see, the enemy can't defeat you. He can't stop you. The Bible says greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. The enemy can't stop you. He can't defeat you because the Bible says no weapon forged or formed against you will prosper. That means that he can't defeat you. He's already defeated. And the only way he can win is if you quit. We make mistakes. We fall down. 
We hurt ourselves and we hurt others. But things happen in our life that want to make us quit and give up and throw up our hands. I'm going to attempt to sing a song this morning. When I go to preach, I usually preach and sing. That way, if you like my singing, you'll invite me back. Or if you like my preaching, you'll invite me back. I've got two chances to get invited back. If you don't like either one, I'm in trouble, but that's all right. But this song uh, is for somebody here today. I don't know who you are. I'm probably not here for everybody. Not everybody's going to love me. But I'm probably not here for everybody, but I know I'm here for one or two. If you're in a place today in your life and you're ready to quit and you're ready to give up or you're struggling and you know what to do next, let this song minister to you. Let it touch you. Go ahead and play the track, gentlemen. And I believe today that the Lord has a word for us, something special. Amen. Turn it up as loud as they can stand it. Amen. It's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to give up. So don't quit. You say, well, Bishop, it's over. I failed. I've fallen short. I'm going to tell you a story this morning about David that you might not know. How many of you got giants in your life? Anybody? How many of you have faced a Goliath in your life? If you've got a Bible with you, we used to say turn in your Bible too, but now we say open your Bible up. Turn your Bible on. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, there's a very familiar story here. A story about Goliath and a story about a young shepherd boy. 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 16 tells the story about David, how that David went out to face a giant, and it describes the giant, tells how big he was, tells the size of the giant. There are different conflicting interpretations of how tall this giant was. Some scholars say that he was nine feet. Some say that he was 10 feet. Some say he was as much as 12 feet. I don't know about you, but I don't care if he's 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, 11 feet, or 12 feet. He's bigger than me. And a giant facing you, not only for one day, not only for two days, but repeatedly. He comes out, the Bible says, in challenges. And we don't have time to read the entire verses this morning, all through verse 16. But David, in verse 14, says he was the youngest of three eldest That followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself for how long? 40 days. Not one, not two, but for 40 days. It's one thing to face a giant in your life one time. It's one thing to face a giant in your life five times. But for 40 days straight, the giant says, I'm going to kill you. Send me out a champion. Tell me somebody who's in your camp that can take me out. 40 days. Let's pray. Father, for the next few moments, I ask you, Lord, to help us. Help us to understand where we are. Help us to understand who we are in you. And what our possibilities are and what we can do to overcome in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Now, if you'll help me, I'll preach about 20 minutes. If you don't, I'll follow you to Pizza Hut and finish. Anybody remember Peanuts? Pig Pen. Charlie Brown. Remember those guys? Snoopy? Everybody knows Snoopy. There was a character in Charlie Brown named Pigpen. Pigpen is the one that carried a blanket around. He always had an atmosphere around him. Remember the drawing, the cloud? Is anybody here? 
Remember the drawing of the cloud around pig pen? He always carried an atmosphere. So wherever he went, there was an atmosphere around him. So if he went into a room, that atmosphere was with him. If he went into a store, that atmosphere was with him. Wherever he was, he carried that atmosphere around. Some people's atmosphere are more pronounced than others. Can I get an amen? Have you ever been sitting at a table, and all of a sudden somebody comes and sits behind you in the booth, and they're wearing a strong cologne or a strong perfume? The atmosphere has changed. At the risk of being crude or uncouth, I won't talk about other atmospheres that involve covers and putting them over your head, but that's a whole other deal. An atmosphere, oh, you're loosening up a little bit. An atmosphere is invisible, but it's noticeable. An atmosphere is invisible, but it's noticeable. When you come into this room, when you come into this house, the atmosphere is thick with the presence of God. It is invisible, but it's noticeable. As a pastor and a bishop for almost 42 years now, well, actually, I just turned 60, so I've been doing this for a long time. It's been longer than 42 years. But I will tell you that I've gone into different houses, different churches, different places, and you feel an atmosphere. You sense an atmosphere. It's It's not tangible in the sense that you can't see it, but it's noticeable. Individuals carry an atmosphere. Some folks walk into the room with a sign on their chest that says, I'm angry. Some walk in with a sign on their chest that says, I've been hurt. Don't bother me. I'm wounded. Some are cynical. Some are sassy. Some are funny. Some are party killers. Some are even from other countries or other States like Arkansas and people in the north don't really understand plain English. But not only do individuals carry an atmosphere, marriages carry an atmosphere. Families carry atmospheres. Churches carry atmosphere. Businesses. When you go into a business, there's an atmosphere. Somebody asked him the other day, some how can revival and the power of God break out in one church but not in the other church down the street? How can healings happen in that man or woman's ministry but not in the other's ministry? It's because the atmosphere that people create when they walk into a room, you carry an atmosphere with you. And what you're going through is plain to some folks who can see it. What you're carrying in your life the burdens and the problems and the weights and the worries and the hurt and the frustration. The Holy Spirit wants to help you deal with that. And there's no, I know, you know, I'm, I'm just going to lay it out up front. I'm, I, I, vote, I vote conservative. And I don't think for a moment that in America right now, anybody is going to be able to fix the problem. Because what we have right now is not a political issue. We have a spiritual issue. Only Jesus can fix it. The analogy that I would say to this is that there are some folks who are thermostats and some folks who are thermometers. Some folks are there to test the temperature of the room and some folks are there to change the temperature in the room. Some people are like thermometers. They take the temperature. Some are like thermostats. They set the temperature in the control. I would propose that we need leaders that are thermostats and not thermometers. I don't need your assessment. I need your assistance. Well, glory to God. Love the way you're shouting. Have you ever stopped to think about what pervading atmospheres in your life, in your family, your church, your home? In Genesis 1, we read the famous words, let there be light. The atmosphere was dark, but God said, let there be light. The word let there, you know, sometimes I'll ask my wife, would you let me have a Coke? At 60 years old, she's trying to get me off of sugar and trying to get me all straightened up. She's 47, and she wants me to live long enough. I've got, I've got six kids, 33 down to eight years old, six grandchildren. I know I don't look a day over 40, but I'm a few days over that. 
So when I asked her permission, would you let me have a cookie? Can I have a, would you let me have a cookie? You know, I'm, I'm about the age where I say, where you hear people say, hey, Steve, you want a cookie? That's a joke. So when I say, will you let me have something, it's almost a question. Will you allow me to? But when God said, let there be light, he wasn't asking darkness to fail. He was commanding darkness to fail. The Hebrew word let there in the, in the Hebrew actually means for darkness to fail. It is a commandment because Darkness is the absence of light. And when God said, let there be light, he wasn't asking permission. And I'll tell you today that if you'll stop asking permission of the enemy in your life, would you just leave me alone? Why don't we command him to leave us alone? Stand up and do what God's called us to do and believe and act like we believe what we believe. I've got to skip past some of this. I've been, I was praying the other day, and the Lord began to deal with me about three words. Actually, one word, and it's a prefix, R-E, re. Words like replant, rebuild, refurbish, repent, recreate, rebuild. These all begin with re. You know, God, anybody ever heard the word Repentance. What does repentance mean? I've asked a hundred people this question in the last several months. What does the word repentance mean? You know what their first response is? Forgiveness. Would that be yours? Repentance does not mean forgiveness. Repentance in the Greek and the Hebrew means to turn. Literally means to turn. In Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, when he says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and and the word repent there, mean, and he says to turn from their wicked ways is the same word that we get repent. I was driving in Dallas, Texas the other day, and I was in the wrong lane. Anybody ever been to Dallas? If you've never been to Dallas, if you want to see some intersections and all this crazy, 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 over, crazy crossover, you go to Dallas. And I was in the wrong lane, and I had to get over. And I had to cut across three lanes to get over in the proper lane so I wouldn't be in that maze. And when I did that, the Holy Spirit came and sat down in the car and said, you just repented. <laughs> God, what did I do wrong? He said, you just repented. Because the day before, I had done the same thing and got on the wrong road. I said, Holy Spirit, what are you talking about? He said, you just repented. He said, you didn't take the wrong way like you did last time. He said, do you know the definition of repentance? I said, yes, it means to turn. He says, when do you turn? Forgiveness is asking forgiveness after we have transgressed or caused someone to hurt. But repentance is, watch this, we turn before we sin the same sin again. We turn before we sin the same sin again. And so repentance is not after we sin. Repentance is before we sin. We turn. We make the turn. We make the difference. And the enemy wants you to quit. If the enemy can get you to stop turning, if the enemy can get you to stop reversing, if the enemy can get you to stop turning from the things that he wants to destroy you with, that's what repentance is all about. God wants to repent you. God wants to repent you. This, this water bottle right here, you know, the Bible says that man fell from heaven. Well, if man fell, that means he fell from the place where God originally put him. Can I get an amen? Now, in 40 years, if you come back, that's what's going to be sitting here if nobody picks it up. This water bottle is going to be sitting here for the next 40 years. What this water bottle needs is not forgiveness. This water bottle needs somebody who will pick it up and put it back to the place where it was originally intended to be to help it repent and turn and get back to the place. That's why this water bottle needed me to be its savior, and I needed Jesus to be my savior to repent me and put me back where I'm not what I'm supposed to be. And thank God that people don't repent me. People don't put me back people are not my savior but Jesus is my savior and what matters most is not what people think or what people say but what God says about me thank you for that golf shout
I've got to hurry. Giants create an atmosphere. They create a bad one. Can I get an amen? 40 days. How, many, how long was he there? 40 days? I could give you a whole list of things about 40 in the scripture. 40 days of rain, 40 days and nights, 40 days of fasting, all of these things. But the number 40 is used by God to represent what? It represents self-judgment and a period of testing and a period of understanding. I've got to give you this. If you understand anything at all, anybody ever studied the Hebrew alphabet? If you study the Hebrew alphabet at all, you understand that the Hebrew alphabet, each letter has a picture. Then it has what the word, the, the actual letter looks like. And then it has a numerical value. In other words, Aleph would be R-A, which means Aleph is the sign of an ox. Tav is the last one. It's the sign of a cross. 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Isn't it amazing that the alphabet starts with an ox and ends with a cross? Because it's important to understand that it began with the sacrifice of animals, but ended at the sacrifice of the cross of Jesus Christ. The numerical values, if you count the first 10 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, they start at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But once you get to the 11th letter, it doesn't go 11, 12, 13. In Hebrew, it starts to multiply. So when you go from the 10th letter to the 11th letter, it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. 10 means the end of testing. Why do you think God said give a tenth of your income? After the ten, God begins to multiply. Now, I just gave you a financial principle and a financial secret, and you missed it. If you want your your money to multiply, you've got to pass the test of tenth. Oh, wait, that's not... They don't like that. Let's move on from there. (laughs) 40 days. For 40 days, Goliath judged Israel's armies. 40 days. But David had already judged himself. You know, in 1 Corinthians 11... The Bible says in verse 31, 32, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. It is important that I judge myself so God doesn't have to judge me. What does it mean to judge? What's a judgment? It means a decision in the correct direction. I learned in the courts a lot of things about Revelation. The book of Revelation, I learned a lot about the book of Revelation by watching what goes on in the courtroom. But there's always a judgment. How many of you know there's a difference between judging someone and then receiving a judgment? A judgment has a winner and has a loser. It is important that we judge ourselves So that God doesn't have to judge us in the sense of correcting us. Judgment is for correction, not for punishment. Judgment is for correction, not for punishment. So if I can self-correct before God has to correct me, that's in my interest. For 40 days, Goliath judged Israel. Why? Because he said, send me out somebody. Send me out somebody who can fight me. Send me out somebody. And Saul even said, you know, we got all these great men, all these great fighters, all these. Saul was towering above every man. Why are we, why are we hiding in the mesquite bushes? Because a giant has challenged us. And then a little 17-year-old boy, if you read the entire story, comes running across the creek, jumping out and shouting for the battle. He's excited about the battle. 17-year-old boy, hadn't even started shaving yet. The Bible said he was ruddy, redheaded, and he comes running across the creek and looks at the giant, and he looks at everybody, and he says, what is going on here? And across, across the way, this giant is saying, cursing God, literally cursing God. And nobody will stand up. 
And so David comes along and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Saul offers him his daughter. If anybody can kill the giant, I'll give you my daughter. I, I believe that David said, well, let me see the girl. <laughs> David comes into the camp, and, and Saul tries to put his armor on him. But you know the story. 1 Samuel 17, you go a little bit further, in verse 23 through 20, 26. And the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, spake according to the same words. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled before him, and were sore, extremely afraid. And then for 40 days they had listened to this, and a little boy comes back in bringing some lunch. And he says, who is this uncircumcised? He heard the words because he cursed God. I've heard it said that David, I've heard it said that David knew the size of his God and compared the size of his God to his giant. But here's what David knew. David knew the scripture said, you cannot curse God and live. So when David heard Goliath curse God, he knew that God would kill him. Sometimes you have to let God fight your giants and you have to stand up to them and believe that God will fight for you. David killed Goliath not on the 38th day, not the 40th day, but on the 41st day day. Bishop, why is this important? Because Jesus defeated the devil on the 41st day in the wilderness. The Bible says that after he had fasted for 40 days, the enemy came. On the 41st day, the enemy is going to come to you and he's going to declare himself. But on the 41st day is the day when you stand up and you know that God's going to fight for you is the day that you win and the victory you overcome. I dare you to change your enemy, your atmosphere. If you judge yourself for 40 days, if you'll change who you are, if you'll take a look at who you are and take a look at where you are, and you'll sit and think, my atmosphere needs to change. My attitude needs to change. Maybe things are going difficult in my house because of my attitude. Maybe everybody around me is struggling because of my attitude. If we will change and judge ourselves, I believe that on the 41st day our giants will fall. And we'd all fall down dead if pastor got up and said, we're going on a 40-day fast. We'd fall down dead on the second day. But for 40 days, flies die after 40 days. There's so much in this. And I challenge you in this new year, this is not a resolution, but I challenge you for the next 40 days from tomorrow to count on your calendar I challenge you for the next 40 days to take a moment and judge yourself and look at yourself and what can I change about who I am? What can I change about my atmosphere? What can I make a difference on? And any giant that you're facing or any giant that's in your family, I believe will fall on the 41st day if you'll get serious with God. Forty-one means separation, but forty-two in the Hebrew means the word arrival. If you'll judge yourself for forty days, and you'll make the changes that are necessary to please God. On the forty-first day, your giant can fall. And you can separate yourself from the hurts and the anguish and the frustrations. And on the 42nd day, you will arrive at the place where God wants you to be. David became king, not when they made him a, gave the coronation to him, but David became king on the 42nd day after he defeated the Goliath on the 41st day because all of Israel would not fight and nobody would stand up and fight. But a little 17-year-old boy said, I'll fight because God's going to fight for us. You may have gotten some bad news. Maybe the doctor gave you a diagnosis. Maybe 
He told you you had cancer. You heard some bad news about a friend. Or you have something in your life that you don't know what to do or how to deal with. Don't quit. Give God, give God a chance. Say, Bishop, what do I do? I dare you to take 40 days. Believe God and stand and fight your giant on the 41st day. And I believe on the 42nd day, God will give you great victory and great blessing. He said, Bishop, when is it? When is it? 42 days from tomorrow will fall on the weekend of February, I believe, the end of February, February 28th, somewhere in that neighborhood. But I believe today that you're going to face a challenge. The enemy is going to try to get you to quit. He's going to get you to throw up your hands. Whatever giant it is you're facing is going to raise its head and going to really try to destroy you. But if you'll press through and break through, God will fight for you. Can I get an amen? All over this building for just a moment, would you bow your heads? I was... Just asking the Lord about the direction of today. And I believe I've heard from him and I believe I've done what he asked me to do. But if you're here this morning and you are in a position, you say, Bishop, I think at one point in time, especially for the last several days or weeks, I'm struggling. And I've just thought about giving up. Would you pray for me? Let me see your hand. Anybody at all? Bless you. Just right up and right back down. I'm not going to come to you, call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else? God bless you, sir. Anyone? Bless you, sir. Would everyone stand across the building, please? I don't know if we have the keyboard players still in the room or not. If I've said something today that's blessed you, would you say amen? Amen. If I've said something today that's made you mad, would you say, oh, me? (laughs) If I've said something today and you're in agreement with me that we need to destroy the giants in our life, would you say amen? amen? It's too soon to quit. Don't you give up. Don't give up on America. Don't give up on your house, your home, your family. Don't give up on that son or daughter who may be a prodigal because God's bringing prodigals home. It's hard. But the Bible says... The yoke of Jesus is easy. His burden is light. Why? Because he rolls it all onto him. So whatever you're facing today, whatever giant is in front of you, know that the 41st day is coming for you if you'll stand. Here's what's amazing is that Those who were unwilling to fight had to wait 40 days. David was willing to fight and had to wait one day. All you got to do is stand up to your giant. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this building, one more question. If you're here today, you say, Bishop, I'm not saved. I'm not giving my heart and my life to God. I'm not where I need to be with God. Would you pray for me? Just real quickly, right up and right back down. Would you raise the hand? Let me see it. Anybody? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? I want you to pray two prayers with me before I release this back to Pastor Randy. Pray this out loud with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, cleanse my heart. 
cleanse my life. Thank you for your forgiveness. I turn now and repent from anything that's not pleasing to you. Now, Lord, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. My giants are going to fall. And I'm going to walk in victory and in power and the anointing of God over my family because I am blessed in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now listen to me. The Bible says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Okay? That's not just to get you to shout loud, but a voice of triumph. Watch this. It's not a shout in advance of the victory, but it's a shout from the place of victory. The promises of God are yea or yes and amen. That means that you've already received the promises of God. You've just got to go to the promises of God and confess back from the promises of God. In other words, the Bible says in Romans, God calleth those things which be not as if they already were. So with the voice of triumph, we don't shout for victory and have hope we have victory. We shout from a place of victory. So God's giving you the victory today. Your giants are already falling. God's already working on your behalf. So before we turn this back to Pastor Randy today, we're going to shout unto God with a voice of triumph from a place of victory because we believe that God's already won the war. Can I get an amen? So however you want to shout today, shout it out. I'm going to count to three. And whatever you want to shout a hallelujah, a yabba dabba do, whatever you want to do, shout from a voice of victory and a place of triumph and a voice of triumph. Can I get an amen? One, two, three. Hallelujah! One more time. Hallelujah! Give God a hand clap of praise in this house. Amen. Pastor, come on. Amen. Are you challenged today? Are you encouraged today? Amen. Well, Steve, thanks. And, uh, for sharing, for encouraging, for lifting. And he made a challenge. 40 days. I'm in. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for our brother who came and delivered it. I pray a blessing over Steve. I thank you for his family who this weekend has given him up to come and bless us and just put a blessing over his home and a covering today. God, I pray a blessing over the bridge. These great people that love you, Lord, so much. They love each other. They love our community, God. And we want to get better so we can reach more people that are looking for you. And Lord, I ask that you would do that today. Just work on each and every one of us as only you can to get us in the place that you can use us. Lord, help us on these 40 days to put ourselves right before you and ask you, God, for your help to change us, to make us better, to cleanse us, to wash us. Whatever you need to do, Lord, do it now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go, and we'll see you next Sunday or Wednesday night for worship, 7 o'clock. Have a great week.